The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. This time out, we're going to tackle something that's somewhere in between the Star Wars Christmas special and a Drew Barrymore romantic comedy vehicle. That's right, it's Snow White Happily Ever After. What the fuck? Um. Hey everyone, this is Michael T. Bradley. With Marisha Parker. And we are going to be talking about the beloved 1990 animated film, Snow White Happily Ever After, which is a sequel to Snow White. and Actually beloved by many. Yes. <laughs> you know, Marisha, something that I was thinking about when I was watching this is... I don't actually remember what happened in Snow White, so I was wondering if, for, for people like me who aren't really big, you know, Disney or classic fans, could could you maybe sum up quickly Snow White? I mean, I know there, I know there's, you know, fairest one of all, and the, and the queen tries to kill Snow White, right? But I was like, how do they get rid of the queen? What's it? Well, oh, you know what? I don't actually remember in the Disney version how they get rid of the queen. I, I know that they do. But yeah, for for this movie, um, it actually leaves quite a bit un like unsaid about what happened in the last movie. So if you ha like had never seen Snow White, you know the original one, you're just kind of screwed. But um, yeah, so Snow White ended with well, it had Snow White, seven dwarves, prince who kisses her after she falls asleep, all of that, and then at the very end, Snow White goes riding off into the sunset with Prince Charming or whatever his name is. And then that's where it ends. And then this movie picks up, picks up like almost exactly where that left off. Yeah. Okay. So only it's not Disney, and it's not uh, a real con continuation. Okay. So we don't. We do you remember like in the original version of Snow White how the queen gets dispatched? Like the original fairy tale. Yeah. I mean, just any be, version. Uh... I mean, like, does the? I mean, it can't be that like the prince murders her, right? No. I. She might have been like eaten by crows or something i i really don't remember i or she fell off a cliff i don't know okay all right so we, so in any case somehow this evil queen who is jealous of snow white's beauty is dispatched and uh they go off to the, the snow white and the prince go off to live happily ever after this one picks up moments after that with the queen's evil brother malice played by malcolm mcdowell Coming and finding the queen's gone, and all of the wacky cartoon animal sidekicks she kept. Which only appear very shortly, and then are gone from the entire film. Well, except for two, but we can, we can get into that more right. later. But and, and, and he finds out from them that the queen has somehow been taken away, and the magic mirror lets him know that Snow White and the prince are living happily ever after, and so he goes after them. Uh, hijinks and Sue. <laughs> who was the voice for the magic mirror? Because it seemed Dom a little out of place tonight. Yeah, him. Yeah, I don't know about the mirror, but uh, I, I mean, it was entertaining, but it seemed a little out of place. Um, I so many things seemed out of place to me. But yes, anyway, definitely. we 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 will get through. We if we get through this plot synopsis, we can <laughs> we can <laughs> we'll we'll discuss all this. But I just I'm so. The, this, the plot is so circuitous at times that I don't know what's worth mentioning. I mean, essentially, then, you know, eventually Snow White takes care of him and they go off to live happily ever. I mean, it's, it's the exact same plot as Snow White, except with dwarf elves instead of dwarfs and malice instead of the queen, right? I mean, right. I, so everyone's gender bent, essentially, except for, I guess, the, like, Snow White and the prince. Yeah, yeah. So it's, um, uh, so that's it. The wacky gender bending sequel <laughs> to some version of Snow White, to every version of Snow White, I guess it tried to be. Yeah, I guess so. So, Marisha, why don't you explain <laughs> why you have no what the fuck moments for this film? Okay. <laughs> Well, okay, it's not that they don't exist. I know that they exist. I mean, I watched the movie. I saw the wackiness. Like, I saw all of that. But I watched this movie a ton when I was a kid. Like, I, like a lot. You know when you're a kid and you just you can just watch a movie over and over and over again and it never gets boring? That This movie was one of those for me. Like, it was just something that we watched a lot. And so I, I knew it too well and I was too... Like, I... I looked at the characters and they were all ridiculous and full of what the fuck moments, but I was like, oh, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I, I remember as a kid, my friends, like, I had a copy of Spaceballs, and I had friends who, every week, they wanted to watch Spaceballs, and, like, literally after two or three weeks, I was like, oh my god, this film is ruined for me now, because they keep so watching. So you had better taste as a kid, that's fine, I understand that. No, 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 I'm just saying it's weird to me, because I've seen this in kids now, who who love watching the same thing over and over again. And mm-hmm. I remember always being annoyed if a G.I. Joe was a repeat, you know? Like, I mm. I was always like, it's dead to me now. So, the what-the-fuck moments are just going to be me. My three are the amazing stick versus a dragon fight. At one point, everyone appears to be engulfed by a river of blood. And the fact that... This movie is ostensibly a musical, but the songs disappear after about 30 minutes. Yeah. All right, Marisha, the first thing that I would like to tackle (laughs) with this movie is the racism. (laughs) Racism? Yeah, did you notice the racist monkey caricature at one point? Oh, for for like a second that the... Yeah, there's like... there's there's like a racist monkey caricature that essentially God has created. Phyllis Diller plays Mother Nature, who is basically God, another, I guess, right. kind of gender bend on the typical God showcase. And there's a monkey that's in like, you know, it, it reminded me of like Paula Deen's version of black people, right? Like, it's so cute when they dress up in uh, tails and a top hat and pretend they're human. And, and the monkey's like that. And then at the end... I I couldn't help feeling like it was like, oh, thank God we're all pretty and white again. Because throughout... But all of Dorfels are all multicolored. Like it's very, and, and so many of the characters aren't even human. How can you say that? Well, I think about the enough. prince. So the prince for most of the movie... Like, like for most of the movie, I, I made a note that was like they are being haunted by Orko. Because throughout the, the movie, there is this character who's wrapped in bandages, hides their physicality because they're embarrassed by it and the only like piece of their physicality we get are these kind of grayish greenish hands that the quality on youtube which by the way this film is available on youtube for free so if, if you're curious go take a gander and come back and let us know what you think but it's, it's very obviously non-white and and at one point, I remember I, I figured out, you know, oh, this has to be the prince because there's no other character it could be. You know what I thought was interesting, though, is that over the course of this movie, the OK, so at the very beginning, Snow White and the prince are going to be married. And like, that's the entire like for for them, that was what they were just going to go do. And then she loses the prince. And then this this creature comes along who's been transformed and she doesn't know who he is over the course of the movie they kind of befriend each other and then at the very end she admits that she like she doesn't know it's the prince but she says that she loves this this creature as much as she loved the prince and so like the entire i i don't know i th- i that was it was just like for a split second that like they even mentioned that but i thought that was kind of weird that she would just own up to oh yeah i fell in love with this other dude who i didn't know was you right yeah it was actually you i i noted i know i cared for orko as much as the prince is what i wrote down which i don't think is an exact quote but i'm it could be it's very similar yeah except (laughs) not orko i don't don't think they copied it i i don't think they skimped on the character design actually like they like the the original seven dwarves like they were I, I felt like the dwarf elves were actually much less flat than the original dwarves as characters. I, since I don't remember the original dwarves, I, I, I honestly don't know if I've ever seen Snow White. I have no idea whether I agree or disagree on that, but I have multiple times where I wrote down, like, I cannot believe how bad this animation is. <laughs> like, this was this was made... This came out one year before Terminator 2. That's what really blew me away. This is 1990. Terminator 2 was 1991, and it looked like this. Like, throughout it, it appeared that Snow White either had gout or she was... Like, her silhouette was the same as the alien head. Well, you know, I I don't... This is... 
pretty low budget film. I'm pretty sure this was direct to video. What can you expect? I think I could be wrong, but I I would almost guess that this the reason that I compared it to the Star Wars the holiday special at the beginning is because, you know, the Star Wars holiday special was very obviously done as like a way to showcase the stars of CBS or whatever that upcoming year. And I I would almost bet that that's what this was, that it was kind of a Except mm. rather than the upcoming year, kind of a, you know, celebration of, of TV stars. Because that's basically, I mean, it was like, you know, Ed Asner. Uh, on the, I remember on the ri- original VHS cover, like, there was there was the cover and then like a whole bunch of it was taken up by the pictures of everyone, of all the voice actors. So like they were trying to sell it that way. Well, that's the thing that really shocked me is that for the voice actors they had the animation was still so bad and maybe i am just spoiled by well i i don't know i don't really watch any modern animation i guess i guess i have watched some anime in the past 10 years or so and you know i guess that's usually better in general you know and and probably if i went back and watched thundercats or he-man which i i watched a fair amount and gi joe which i watched a fair amount of probably i would be shocked at how bad that is and this was a youtube transfer but still even even if you say that the dwarf fells look pretty decent you have to agree that snow white and the prince look fucking horrible especially snow white oh. the prince basically just looks like an anemic prince adam like it, it's literally like prince adam from he-man if he didn't pump iron six hours a day. I, yeah, I, I don't watch He-Man that often, but yeah, I think so. Why not, Marisha? It's it's <laughs> it's really not that good. Don't watch it. But the uh, <laughs> but he has like the same like purple sort of uh, uh, I don't know I don't know what the hell the term for that tunic I guess is that a tunic? A tunic, yeah, 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 that's what it was. Yeah, you know he's got that same purple tunic and the white under undergrowth. He just doesn't have the blonde page boy cut, which. Uh, mm-hmm. I ex- I assume that under that Orco disguise he had that. <laughs> yeah, let's let's assume that. Yeah, but no, it's it's it, but that's the thing. It's like it had that real, you know, she says like I loved you as much as the prince, which was weird considering they had had like three interactions and I'm like, "Whoa, Snow White, you're throwing it around a little too easily here," <laughs> you know. But the uh but the fact that her tears then turn him like it's not Malice's death, it's her tears and her love that turns him back to be white and pretty, and then they can live happily ever after. And it's like, she didn't even need that. But the movie was like, hey, kids, don't worry. He's white and pretty at the end, you know? I Yeah, I guess you could see it that way. <laughs> it was that goddamn monkey that predisposed me to feeling this way. Hmm. The other thing, too, is that the, the one dwarf elf who's red, she's portrayed as, uh, I think, the most uh, uh, grumpy and and uh, uh irritable out of the group and then the one who's kind of brown is the one who always gets in fights with her so it's like you know the non-white ones are the most animalistic i think mm. let's talk about the dwarf elves okay because okay. <laughs> because we've got a a bevy of uh things to pull from there tracy ullman played two of them which i was excited about because i i like uh, i like tracy ullman blossom was fucking hot <laughs> Oh, yeah, and she didn't get enough lines. No, no, definitely With that not. sultry voice of hers. Right, right, yeah, that was Zsa Zsa Gabor, which was a little weird because I remember Zsa Zsa Gabor was very old, but Blossom was, yeah, she was uh, She was pretty, she made me salivate a little. <laughs> we, we had, uh, oh, God, who was the sunlight one that was red? I think her name was just... Sunburn or something. I don't yes, know. yeah, yeah. I think I think that might have been it. I at one point just wrote in all caps, "Stop with the puns," because every time she spoke, it was that really burned me up, and that, yeah, that got tiresome before it even got spoken. And the <laughs> she was kind of strange. Oh, the other thing too. The other thing back to the racism. Malice is green. Malice, because he is evil, has to be a different color. The queen was in a different color, right? I mean, she's white. I mean, the whole kind of play on words, who's the fairest one of all, it's almost like who is the whitest one of all. Who who else do we have? Oh, I know, the one that I wanted to talk about, because this really pissed me off, 
in general, I was annoyed by the fact that, so like halfway through, Mother Nature slash God slash Phyllis Diller, really it's all the same, even in real life, <laughs> says, uh, tells the dwarf elves that they're dicking around with their powers, they're not using them well enough, they're not taking responsibility, and so she's going to take them away, but she gives them one last chance to help out Snow White, and it's it's like... So you kind of expect that everybody will chip in and do something throughout the rest of the film. Oh, and then, yeah, most of them don't even get lines. Right. And the thing that really upset me was Moonbeam. So Moonbeam is the one who, she gets her powers at night, and I was excited because she was also Tracy Ullman. And then when it's nighttime, she stops just following everybody around with her head on a pillow, which is weird. It, it, it seems as if she was like OCD rather than like a magical dwarf. But she, uh, in, instead of following them around with a pillow, she says, oh, good morning, and then proceeds to have no powers whatsoever. Yeah, that's, I mean, so, yeah, I don't know what Mother Nature could have taken away there. She could have just gotten a day job, really, you know? <laughs> she, and and she, <laughs> she... I don't, I don't care that this doesn't really have any place here, but I'm going to bitch about it anyway. She reminded me of the reason that I hate the new My Little Pony series, Friendship is Magic, and that's because I watched the first episode, and I was totally on Nightmare Moon's side, because I was like, God damn it, I have worked the night shift before, and it sucks because all your friends are out during the day, and you're up at night, and you're just doing your best to earn a dollar, and Nightmare Moon was like, I just want somebody to be a friend. And everybody else was like, fuck you, nighty. You know? It just, oh, oh yeah. my god. So that character motivation just really worked for you there. Yeah. <laughs> so I was so excited to see Moonbeam get a moment, and she just really had none. Instead, it was yeah. all Thunderella. Yeah, who was cute, though. I mean, she got a song and everything. Right. And that was weird, because literally the first, like, three seconds we see her, and she's singing. Yeah. They just jump right into it. Yeah, I think I... Let's see here. I made I made some sort of note on that. I, I said, this sad new character is singing about a fear of thunder. And then a lot of question marks. Because <laughs> it's like, who the hell is she? I don't, I don't know. <sighs> but she started singing. Yeah, that whole introduction of the Dwarf Elves is a little odd because... So, first of all, Snow White is... She's exhausted. She's, she's you know, suffering from exhaustion, and she literally reaches the Seven Dwarves' house. Oh, and then, like, ten seconds before she could have just, like, op she could have just opened the door and gone <laughs> right. in, and instead she just passes out. Right, but her frail, limp white wrist is unable to <laughs> open that door enough to, to get inside, and she passes out on the doorstep. Uh, assumedly, she sleeps through the night on the concrete. She wakes up in a bed in the dwarf house, and the first thing that she does after being so ungodly tired and passing out and sleeping for who knows how long on cement is gets up, twirls her tresses, spins around, and looks in the mirror and is like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but on the best of nights in a tempur bed, I would never be able to do that. So I don't know. Look, when you're the fairest in the land, like, you, I mean, you know that shit. And so, like, that's what she clearly, <laughs> right? You, she's, she's right there all over it. You've just got it. And everybody else apparently thinks she's hot, or at least all the other human characters, which consists of... There aren't many. The prince, I think. Yeah. Because he has... Did you notice that scene where he's, like, brushing the horse and just leering at her? Well, no. <laughs> I did I did pay attention more to him when he was, when he was transformed into this creature, because he was a lot more interesting as this frightened, anxious, like, self, self-loathing sort of, sort of creature. While he was human, he just leered at her. It wasn't a look of adoration, it was like... Yeah, it's all mine. I'm tapping that. It was incredibly <laughs> creepy. But but then he then Malcolm McDowell turns him into a creepy figure, but just allows him to roam the land, which seemed a little strange. Yeah. A lot of all the bad guys' <laughs> motivations were murky at best. And, well, and can we talk about the the owl and his motivations and his like unhealthy like attachment to this Lord Malice, who like he keeps every so often he. Every, like every time something bad happens, he's like, "I'm running away, and we're never gonna like we're never gonna have to deal with him again." And then the very next second, he's like, "Oh wait, let's let's do something to win Lord Malice's favor back." Just that happened a few times. And I think to understand 
how committed this character is to being evil, <laughs> we have to point out the fact that his character arc, if you will, starts with him rapping about being bad. Yes, and then throughout the entire movie, they're making puns about bad. Like, they're they're saying just, what feels bad? That feels, you know, like, how does it feel to be bad? Oh, it feels bad. Like, they, they tried to be funny. Why are the dogs trying to eat you? You would be bad food. Yeah, yeah, like that. Yeah, and, 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 and that, was, that was when I had the gun cradled in my mouth at that point. <laughs> It and it doesn't it doesn't get any better. Although I will admit the one character I liked in this entire thing was Batso. Oh yeah, he was cute. The owl's conflicted sidekick. I mean, I I yeah. can only assume that he has some sort of weird crush on Scowl the owl. But which might be the case. But he was also cool because he told it like it was. Like the owl kept getting into shit with Malice, like get, getting in trouble, and the bat was just like, "Oh, that's that's your problem. I I didn't do anything wrong." Right, right. Like Malice doesn't want to stir fry me, and that was Frank Welker, who is like the most talented voice ever. Uh, so I I was I was happy that he got a speaking role. The yeah that owl, um, yeah. <laughs> He just, he doesn't really serve any narrative purpose. Except to inhibit the guy that he's trying to help out. It is a little strange that we aren't really shown that, like, evil won't win out in the end. It's like, evil won't, evil would win out in the end if there weren't idiots working for him. But, but even at the very end, though, like, the message is clearly... Don't smoke. Well... Oh yeah, that's that's the character arc of the owl, where he goes from being bad and smoking, and then at the very end, like he takes the cigar, or he gets his cigar taken away from him, and and now he's a good guy again. The clear moral of this story is: don't smoke, and be white. Mm. <laughs> I think I feel some hesitance on your part about accepting the racist overtones of this. I. Film. I... <laughs> did not see that at all. I I am a little concerned about your strange projections. I don't know. <laughs> the, yeah, so that that owl who's Ed Asner, uh of course, he and Batso have some some of the worst dialogue. And I this is something that really upsets me in in general with kids movies. I hate when they write dialogue down to children. Like I I that just drives me insane because yeah i know what you mean because it's like whether it's written badly or well i you know i kids aren't necessarily processing it but they're memorizing it and it's like i I would rather have them digesting things that are well written like you know I, i i doubt most kids watching like i don't know finding nemo or uh, what do kids watch these? I don't. I don't have a clue, Marisha. I, you know, I doubt any kids watching that are like, this story structure really holds up well. But or or <laughs> or you know, oh, that's a clever play on words that Ellen DeGeneres just had there. She's she's in that, right? Yeah. But it it. But I do think that it it makes a difference, and that uh, kids can tell. Maybe I'm wrong because I watch. Well- I th- I think they can tell like to like at a certain point there's there's you know when you're a kid you you haven't developed taste yet you don't know what the difference is between something good and something bad when you're a kid your your process of judgment is just it it's based on what you see and there's no reason to like for this for this movie at least I guess maybe I don't know maybe I'm getting defensive because because <laughs> I I was a kid watching this movie but like Watching it, it was just, that was just the movie. That was just how it was. No big deal. No, I, I get what you're saying. On the other hand, though, I, I think kids definitely have taste. It, it's maybe not necessarily good taste. Like, for instance, I tried rewatching uh, Thundercats a few years back. I, I don't know, rented it from the library or something. And I was like, oh, my God, this is terrible. I mean, it was really horribly done, but... There was like a you know Mumra is the bad guy and he's this friggin' like mummy whose wrappings come off and he's all big and evil looking and I'm like okay that's why I liked it you know mm. 
here are, you know, uh, the, the, the cool factor. Like, for instance, you know, I was, I think, five or six when V was coming out, uh, the television series and the, the, the TV movie, and I fucking love that shit. And I'm like, what five or six year old is eating up V, right? But for me, it was like the lizard people and that kind of feeling that people around you weren't what they seemed and everything. So that really worked for me. And and watching it now, I, I, I rewatched that a few years back, and it's like the original miniseries is amazing. I mean, it's all a, a Nazism, fascism allegory, and it's really powerfully done. But at the time, I was not like, this is a brilliant allegory for fascism. <laughs> Right. I was like, well, these are this is this is cool. This looks cool. Right. They rip and, off their face. It's lizards under. Oh my god, lizards. And okay, uh, but what about, for this movie? There was at least the bad guy was kind of cool. Like at the very end, where he turns into this cool dragon statue with the with his head, like in this transformation sequence where he's just like, I don't know. I thought the ending where he died was really cool. Yeah, he turns into a like a Gojira size statue with. That was really weird. He just kept getting zapped by different lightning. <laughs> oh, yeah, because he was... Okay, so he was supposed to turn to stone because they threw bigger. the magic blanket over him to turn him to stone. And But the process is delayed a little bit. And so instead of immediately turning to stone, he turns into a dragon. He gets electrocuted into his mouth. His head turns into a human again, and then he turns to stone. Yeah, that was definitely the money shot of the film. Yeah. You, you, they they yeah. put their talented people to work on that that little uh, that little moment in there. Uh, everything else was like they spent the rest of their budget on that. After they <laughs> right, it was it was like voice talent, that transformation, and uh, then like the the kind of scrapings that were left over were used to animate everything else. <laughs> The uh the they were like Snow White, Alien Head, whatever. It's all good. Yeah, and, and Malice also must appreciate Snow White's beauty since he's going to turn her into a statue, right? I, I, I... There was that at the end, although like from the very beginning, like he, he had his mission statement and that was vengeance. Yeah, he's very quickly turned to vengeance. I love how he's like just out of the blue, he flies into the castle and is like Hey, sis, what's up? Oh, she's gone? Somebody got rid of her? I swear vengeance forever! Not just not just vengeance either, but he, like, as soon as he find out, finds out his sister's dead, he says, he swears vengeance, and he, like, transforms the land. He says, I'm going to bend the laws of time and space to my will, and, like, completely, like, he turns this entire land into the land of doom. Yeah. And I was like, why, like, you could have done that, like, with your sister. You could have, like, taken, what were you waiting for? Why, why would... Yeah, wait. their family history possibly needed a little more fleshing out, I think. <laughs> Very possibly. Well, they, I mean, they just put him in there because they needed a villain and she was dead. Right. It, 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 the, that was my big problem with him in general is that he's just so generically, eh, what if they fight another bad guy that's basic, you know, the, the, really there's no difference between the two. That kind of upset me. And was there... I mean, I guess there must have been magic in the first one. Like, the witch does give her a sleeping apple or something, right? But... Yeah, there's there's an enchanted forest that might sort of count as magic. And then she's... And then the evil queen, yeah, has her... She has her magic to transform her into, into like, an old woman and stuff and the apples. But that's that's really about it. I don't think there's... Like, Snow White doesn't have any magic or... The, and the dwarves don't. That was... The, so, like, they gave the Dorfels magic for this movie. Nature, I mean, they're more like Wiccans than, <laughs> than, uh, than magicians, I guess, right? Right, and imbued with you know God's power of nature, which which is also used to create like bad puns out of animals. Oh my God, that I I was really disappointed in God in this film. It was very. It, I don't think I've been as disappointed in God since uh, Star Trek V. What does God need with a starship? I, I just. I wanted Bones to come on screen and be like, well, "Why is God making a Dormouse pun for God's sake?" Yeah. I was really sad. <laughs> in general, talking about Malice and his kind of generic villainy, I was really sad because I totally thought. This movie would be about irreconcilable differences in the marriage, 
between the prince and Snow White. I thought it would be like oh. uh, the prince is like, oh, you know, you liked me better when uh, when you were dead, and her being like, no, that's not the case. I just wish you would pick up after yourself. That would have been a more interesting yourself. movie. It, it would have been a more interesting <laughs> I, movie with that kind of conflict. I think it, it would have held my interest a bit more. I think, and 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 maybe. You know, there's a there's a farmhand who's kind of hot and and gets a song and she's kind of drawn to him and or hell maybe there's a twisted freak farmhand who's who covers himself all the time but he holds open a door for her and she's like I love you just as much as the prince. <laughs> <laughs> so and here's how much she loves the prince. So I, I, I way back there I was I was trying to get to this point and I didn't quite make it. But so Snow White is completely exhausted. She falls at the door. She sleeps. She gets up. Her beloved has just been kidnapped by a giant horrible dragon, which she refers to as a big bird, which I thought was interesting. It was like, oh yeah, okay, I guess dragons aren't common in this land, but what an odd little tidbit of local history to throw in there for no apparent reason and mm -hmm. and she is 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 freaked out about this and she finds out that the dwarves aren't there and the dwarf elves have taken over the house and what does she do she immediately launches into some girl talk with them rather than oh, yeah. mention that her beloved <laughs> has been taken away she's just like oh ha 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 you girls fighting that's funny and uh thunderella you're gonna be great one day <laughs> I I think I think that is a strange re reaction. But you know, and then I it it kind of fits in with her overall. Like she is just kind of like she's kind of chill about just the fact that she started falling for this other dude. Like she's just she just kind of rolls with whatever happens. Right. She just she just expects everything to be tragedy at any moment, which again could make for a great movie about her feeling the seven year itch after about three weeks. <laughs> I, I did you enjoy how everyone would explain their motivations and and action like all the time like I will try to see what's through this door and and like oh I am so sad that my beloved was kidnapped yeah that's yeah that's just the bad writing <laughs> it, it was it was really bad writing another example of the bad writing was all, were all the horrible segues the prince at one point says who would harm us? <laughs> like, he's he's saying, like, you know, with the queen gone, who would harm us? And it's like, no, 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 you don't, you don't jinx yourself like that. At another point, oh, I'm trying to remember who that was. I just, I just wrote down, this is not how segues work. Somebody says at one point, um, oh, he's probably just looking into the mirror, watching every move of ours right now. And then it cuts to Malice looking in the mirror. And I was like, this is not, the, like, there's just zero subtlety here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> speaking, speaking speaking of okay so things that happen where people are way more oblivious than they should be at one point blossom is using a hand mirror to check herself out because she's hot while she is standing a foot away from the m magic mirror that she comments on like 10 seconds before oh yeah and they have like this this little like they the spark of romance between them. And I honestly think that the script said something like, Blossom checks herself out in the mirror, primping her hair, and whoever was doing the animation was doing the animation for just that moment and didn't see the previous, like, two pages of script and didn't know that there was the magic mirror right beside her. And so just did her looking in a little hand mirror because they didn't know any better. Yeah, that sounds like it. There is also the moment when the cape, which, by the way, spends, like, the first half of the movie just on Malice's shoulders and never turns him to stone. So that's a little right. odd. But the cape, he throws it on the Dwarfels. And it's it's this, oh, shit moment because, you know, they're kind of sort of our heroes, even though they don't do much after their task with doing stuff. He throws it on her... And the camera pulls back, or or the shot changes, and Snow White is standing right behind them and gasps like, "Oh no! This 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 cape that I have seen turn things to stone." 
just landed right on top of them, and I could have easily snatched it away before it hit them. But she's she's not a fighter. She's she's the she spins and looks in the mirror. That's that's what she does. <laughs> she still she was literally inches from it, and just yes. just doesn't just doesn't uh, just doesn't bother. I seriously moonbeam. What I I kept. I kept wanting more Moonbeam. I was rooting for Malcolm McDowell because I enjoyed his uh, monologues much more than anything else. The one problem I had with Malice was he, at one point, uh, he goes and tells Snow White that if she wants to find out what's happened to the prince, she has to come to the castle. And the idea mm -hmm. here is that he wants her to come to the castle so that he can take her to the top of the castle on this pedestal and throw a cape over her and turn her into stone and be reminded of how awesome he is forever because he got his vengeance on the person who killed his uh, his sister, uh, whom he apparently dearly loved, we have to take for granted. Then Snow White and the Dwarf Elves are having a bit of trouble, and so he says, ah, I'm going to send an escort. And so he sends these, like, hellhounds out then the hellhounds, it's almost as if they're trying to eat them, and they outsmart the hellhounds, and he's looking in the mirror, and he's like, dag blasted, or whatever, you know, some G-rated thing. And I was yes, like, wait, but you you didn't want the hellhounds to kill them, right? Like, over and over again, and then the, you know, Orko helps them get away from the hellhounds and get across this chasm so that they can get to the castle, more easily, and later they find a way to get into the castle, even though the drawbridge is drawn up, and, and he seems very perturbed at all of these things, and even at one point goes out and is like, oh, I'll take care of this myself, and goes out as a dragon, and it's like, but you want them to get there. I, I don't... Yeah, I don't know. He seems really indecisive. I guess, you like, it's hard to know what you want when you just, like, have all these powers and you're just bent on destroying people and don't have anything else to do with your time. You're like, it's Maybe it's like ADD. You just can't focus on any one in infliction of pain at a time. Yeah. When, when you're not white, <laughs> you're not right. I think that's really... <laughs> I think that's really the message it was trying to get across. <laughs> now... I, so seriously, uh, again, this, like all of the other films, at least for me, that we've looked at, I'm looking at with um, an adult eye, and I get that, obviously, uh, a lot of the problems that I have are not going to be commented on, at least, perhaps internalized, but not commented on by most, uh, most children, but, I, I mean, overall, when you watched this movie, were you able to... You know, did you have that cognitive dissonance where you were like, I can objectively see that this is a flawed film? Oh, well, yes, of course. I mean, I... I but but the, I don't know. Nostalgia and familiarity, like, they, the effect they have on that sort of thing, is, it just kind of diminishes the, um... I, I don't know, the... Poopitude? Irrit irritability that that would have on me normally, Okay, perhaps? okay. Uh, this was... I'm not going to say it was the worst 75 minutes of my life, but this definitely made the list, I think. this was Really? I, I... You enjoyed it less than Air Bud 2? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> Though Air Bud 2 was difficult to get through, but mostly I was just bored. With this, I was like, oh my god, I feel sorry for children in 1990. And I mean, I was 12 <laughs> in 1990, so it's not like I was you know, out earning a living or anything. So, yeah, all right. So I don't know if it will be possible for you to answer this or not, though, but let's, you know, let's end it on a uh, at least semi-positive note here with what one thing okay. would you change to make this uh, a better movie? Well, I would have had the all of the Dorfels use all of their powers. Like, the, the furry Dorfell didn't get any, like, she didn't, she didn't get any like powers with her with her animal friends very much at all i don't think and she she got she got to talk to the hellhounds but i don't think it worked right like she yeah like she, they were just there and then and then moonbeam moonbeam obviously didn't didn't get anything so i would have liked to like i wanted to see them kick ass more yeah. that would have been that would have been way cooler and maybe i would have done something different with the prince like 
I don't know. I I just find it intriguing that she that she fell in love with this other version. Like, what if what if he'd stayed that way and they'd like made that part of the plot of the plot of the movie, like her internal conflict? I totally agree about using the Dorfell's powers more. The fact that they just kind of are there for the second half seems so very strange because it just doesn't it it doesn't feel like um uh, it it feels it feels odd um, the way that they're handled. I, even though Malcolm McDowell is my favorite character, I think the one thing that I would change is I would have Malice played by Gilbert Gottfried. <laughs> you didn't like Malice's, like, amazing, like, snarly, sneery, weird, nasally voice? Malcolm McDowell played it perfectly for how it was written, and that was just really boring overall. Aww. And I think Gottfried would have given it that level of irony and what the hell were they thinking that it would have kept me interested in a different way i i think yeah. i think malcolm absolutely earned his paycheck and did everything that he could to bring that character to life uh, considering who he is but that was not i but you know i i, it, I in fact gilbert godfrey could play every single character in the movie and that would make <laughs> it better for me i think there you go um at least all the bad guys if gilbert godfrey were malice scowl the owl i i think keep bat so the same uh but if he were also probably the mirror uh you know just uh, gilbert godfrey is all the bad guys okay yeah seems fair that, i'll make that my new headcanon <laughs> All right, sounds good. Okay, so for now, this is Michael T. Bradley. This is Marisha Parker. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Have a good one. If you have watched it, if you haven't watched it, if you have any sort of comments or feedback, please write to info at iceonmars.net and tell us what you think. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. You have been listening to Ice on Mars. <laughs>